So the last group of plants that we're going to talk about are the angiosperms. Like our gymnosperms, these guys are also seed plants, but these guys are the flowering plants, which we'll explore more. But in this picture, you can see tons of different angiosperms. And I will like to kind of urge you to keep in mind that when we say flowering plants, all of these plants, yes, have flowers, but some flowers are really, really small. For example, the grass like that you see in a lawn is a flowering plant. Just the flowers are incredibly small. So while yes, wildflowers like this, you're like, ah, a flowering plant, totally. But actually a lot of plants, honestly, you can identify mosses and ferns pretty easily. You can identify a pine tree pretty easily. If it's not one of those three, most likely it's an angiosperm. Whether or not you physically see the flowers, whether they're large or small, the time of year, etc., pretty much everything else is an angiosperm. So similarly to the gymnosperms, they do have seeds. However, the seeds also have a fruit. And we're going to talk a lot more about fruits um, when we're talking about the life cycle. But the fruit can be something like an apple, we think of fruits we eat, but it can also be uh, an adaptation to help it uh, fly in the wind, for example. So we'll, we'll explore that more. These again are the flowering plants, and there's only one phylum within our angiosperms, and that's phylum Anthophyta. So again, all organisms in Anthophyta are in an angiosperm, and all of the angiosperms are in phylum Anthophyta. This was not true of our previous grouping of organisms. There's other phyla when our gymnosperms, there's other phyla in our seedless vascular plants, etc. But this one, it is an exclusive relationship. So before we talk about the life cycle, it's important to talk about the flower because the flower actually is a reproductive structure in and of itself. It has male parts and it has female parts. So I'm going to, this flower is already sketched and I don't, I'm not going to sketch it out. I am going to kind of draw and emphasize some things. I encourage you in your notes to draw this flower and to highlight the different parts of the flower. So I'm going to do that now. I am just going to kind of highlight different things at a time. So within the flower, like you see in this picture, so in this diagram, uh, let's talk about the male part first. Honestly, not just in the plant kingdom, but in the animal kingdom, there's going to be more males to females. The goal is to make a whole bunch of sperm, a whole bunch of male reproductive material. Just cross our fingers that it'll find the female. So within this flower, the male structure is called the stamen. So the stamen is kind of like this little, uh, whatever, branch that has this bulb at the end. That entire structure is called the stamen. There are names for the different parts of the stamen, but don't worry about it. So the stamen, again, is the male reproductive structure. This is where male spores and male gametophytes and stuff like that are going to come out of. This would be analogous to a male cone on a pine tree. All right, the other reproductive structure, so that's the male side, the carpal is the female reproductive structure. And you notice in this diagram, there's one carpal and there's maybe 10 or 12 of the stamens. This is very, very species dependent. You will have some flowers that have, you know, 20 carpels, but then maybe 100 stamens. Like, um, it's not always 1 in 12. Like, this can definitely vary. However, pretty much it's always a lot more stamen than there are to carpels. Now, within the carpel, we are going to break down the different parts because when we get to the life cycle, the different parts of the carpel are going to matter. So let's start, let's start at the top. So at the very top of the carpal, this area right here, this is called the stigma. So the stigma is the very top part. It's kind of a sticky part. It's also the opening. This is how the male reproductive material will enter to fertilize the egg. So the stigma is the opening, and the stigma is also kind of sticky. It's, it's hoping that the male re reproductive material will stick to it to, again, increase the likelihood of successful fertilization. We'll mention this again in the life cycle. So if you're like, I'm not following, it's okay. But I wanted to introduce it at least. When the male reproductive material lands on the stigma, sperm is going to travel through the style. So the style is just the longer part of the carpal, but the sperm is going to travel through it. And so this red line is kind of representing like how the sperm travels. Now the sperm is gonna travel through the ovary 
So the ovary is this larger bulb. So you got the stigmas, the sticky stuff on top. The style is kind of the, the tunnel leading to the ovary. The ovary is this much larger structure. I mean, honestly, it's kind of similar thinking about humans. Females are ovary. So the ovary is the much larger structure, and inside of that structure is an ovule. You can think of the ovule as the egg. Um, it's not exactly synonymous, but it's synonymous enough. Um, inside the ovule will be the egg. The ovule is essentially, actually, I'll go ahead and write this here. The ovule is going to give rise to the seed. The ovary is going to give rise to the fruit. And again, when we do the life cycle, this, this will be reiterated. Now, again, in this picture, this picture is showing one ovary with one ovule in it. There are going to be plants, and we'll talk about examples of these. You might have one ovary that has 20 ovules, that has 50 ovules, that has two ovules. So it's really going to be dependent species to species. And we'll talk about examples because you actually know examples of these. Beautiful. So the last structure on here are petals. <laughs> and the reason I mentioned petals is because what's different between flowers and our pine trees. So our pine trees, the male pollen, released into the world. Just catch it some wind and hope that works. With the pollen on a flowering plant, we have pollinators. There are organisms, typically animals, organism, I say typically, all of them are animals. We have animals that are going to transport that pollen from one flower to another flower. And the way flowers attract those pollinators is one, through the showiness of their petals, and then also the flowers themselves are going to have different materials that pollinators might like, typically uh, nectar, so a kind of a sugary, watery substance. And there's a wide variety of flowers because there's a wide variety of pollinators. And we'll explore this more, but this is why I said earlier when if I, sorry, if you get seasonal allergies due to pollen, the pollen that you're getting allergies to is pine pollen because our angiosperms, their pollen pretty much stays in the flower and it's pollinators moving it. It's not really wind moving that pollen, but more of more so that pollinators are moving it. And we'll talk about how that happens here soon. So last but not least, our last life cycle. You guys, have, you're so close. Pretty much all of these words we saw with the conifers. So we got male and female gametophytes, egg and sperm for our gametes. We've got pollen, we've got a zygote, we got an ovule and ovary. The sporophyte, the micro and megaspore, we got meiosis, the seed, the stigma, the style, um, the anther, actually I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to just cross that out. Uh, we're just using stamen now. Anther is one of the um, specific words, uh, or one of the specific structures within the stamen. So the stamen refers to the entire male structure. Um, the anther is like the specific part of the stamen, but we're just going to keep it general, say stamen, and then the fruit. So, all right, you guys, we got this. I believe in you. Totally believe in you. Let's do this last, 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 last life cycle. You're happy. I'm happy. We're all happy about our last life cycle. It is quite, it's nearly identical to our pines. So you're going to see that I go a little fast just because like it's nearly identical to our uh, conifers that we talked about in our last life cycle. So let's start with our plant. Now our plant's gonna look a little different because instead of looking at the whole plant, actually no, never mind, just ignore all that. All right, here's grass. Here's a leaf, here's a leaf. <laughs> what I'm really trying to draw is <laughs> um, the flower. Oh gosh, you know, I'm like hand drawing this, but that doesn't actually make it any better here is our flower. All right. And then here we have the carpal. And then let's draw some stamen. So apologize for this really, really horrible drawing. Okay. So we are looking at the plant like our ferns, like our pine trees. This is the sporophyte. The flower is part of that plant. The flower is the sporophyte as well. And sporophytes are diploid. We're going to start in our female section, similar to what I did with the pine trees. I'm going to make this isolated. So here is our female part. 
And here, here's my track where I'm going to draw everything. Because like our female pine cones in Phylum coniferophyta, all the steps of the alternation of generations happens in the same location. It happens in the carpal on the sporophyte. So it is a sporophyte. Sporophytes make spores, but this is the female spore. This female spore, much larger than our male spore, this female spore, we give it a nice special name, just like in our pine trees, we call this the megaspore. This megaspore is haploid, and the reason it's haploid um, is because meiosis happened. My, oh, whatever, you know what I'm trying to spell. So, oh, actually, sorry, I'll write it over here. So, in the sporophyte, meiosis happened. As meiosis happen, it's going to create this megaspore, this haploid megaspore. All right, this megaspore doesn't go anywhere. It is staying inside the ovule. So specifically, yes, this is happening in the carpal. That's the female reproductive organ in the flower. But specifically, it's happening in the ovule. So here's that center of the ovule. Inside of that ovule is the megaspore. Inside of that megaspore, or that megaspore is then going to mature. And it's going to mature into the, I'll use stripes just to denote that it's something different. It's going to mature into the female gametophyte. Because sporophytes make spores, spores make gametophytes. So female gametophyte. This female gametophyte staying put. That female gametophyte is going to mature into the egg. Again, the only stage that is diploid is the sporophyte, so our gametophyte haploid, our egg haploid. All of this happening inside of that carpal. Nothing has moved. From this sporophyte, we made a haploid megaspore. We made a haploid female gametophyte. We made a haplo haploid female gamete, the egg. So all of this happened in the female part of the flower. This is all happening inside the ovule. So let's go take a look at our males. So here is one of the stamens. Very similarly to what we saw in our pine trees, the stamen, the, the sporophyte, the stamen, undergoes meiosis. And as it undergoes meiosis, it's creating spores or specifically, oh, sorry, I didn't realize I'm running off the screen. It's creating, I'll write it here, microspores. Because we underwent meiosis, these microspores are haploid. These microspores are going to mature and they're going to mature into the male gametophyte. Again, we went from sporophyte to spores, spores to gametophyte, so nothing, nothing here is novel. The microspores are haploid. They just grew into a haploid gametophyte. The other name for the male gametophyte in seed plants, we saw this in our um, conifers. We're going to see it here in our angiosperms as well. The other name for this is pollen. Now here's what's different, is that in our conifers, pollen was just dispersed by the wind. In our angiosperms, this pollen is picked up by pollinators. So the pollen is just chilling on the stamen, waiting for a pollinator to come visit this plant. So a pollinator comes and visits this plant. Some of that pollen rubs off on that pollinator. And then as that pollinator goes to another plant, that pollen gets stuck to that sticky stigma. So I'm just gonna prepare just a, a drawing real quick. Um, so we're gonna do kind of the top of a flower over here. That's a cool petal. I'm going to draw, I'm just drawing on this flower, the stamen. We're going to draw, the ovule is the green thing, and then here's that hollow brown thing representing um, the, the egg. Here, let me just redraw that because that's a little confusing. Okay. Okay. So, come on. Okay. So here's ovule. 
And earlier I drew the egg as an open brown circle. So this is another flower. A pollinator comes by. Let's say it's a cute little bumblebee. So the pollinator goes by this first flower. Here it is. It's a happy little bee. Comes by, some pollen sticks to it. The, the bee is not trying to pick up the pollen, but the pollen is all over all of these stamens. It's really hard for it to not happen. So the bee has this pollen all over it, and then the bee is flying around this field, and oh, it happens to go over here. The bee's like, look, another flower. I like other flowers. I want more sugary substance. So it flies over here. And some of that pollen that was stuck to it gets stuck to the stigma of this plant. Because remember, stigma, nice and sticky. Sticky. And so that pollen sticks to it. Now remember, pollen's the male gametophyte. We have no sperm yet. But now that this has landed here on this carpal, Every, honestly, everything in the world releases hormones. So this male gametophyte can detect the hormones being given off by, honestly, by the, the ready-to-be-fertilized egg. And it triggers this male gametophyte or this pollen green to start developing its sperm. So the sperm start developing in this male gametophyte, but it's not there yet. Like, it, it's got a journey. And so <laughs> what's really cool, because everything in biology is so cool, is the the um, the male gametophyte has to help with this journey, right? So as the male gametophyte is making um, the sperm, it's also making a tube, like literally making a tube. So I'm gonna draw this, I'm gonna draw this tube. And you're like, how in the hell is it making a tube? Well, it's, your body has tons of tubes in there, right? You've got blood vessels, you've got your throat, you've got like trachea, like you have, tubes in your body. So this making a tube is not novel. So the male gametophyte's just growing, is undergoing mitosis to grow, and it's literally creating a tube to the egg. It's literally making a pathway for the sperm to travel. And so once this tube, this tube is called, it wasn't one of the keywords, but I'll go ahead and tell you, this tube is called a pollen tube. And once this tube is done, um, let me use, uh, I'm sure I'll use this light blue. Once this tube is done growing, the male gametophyte is going to make that sperm. It makes a couple of sperm and the sperm are going to travel down to that egg. And that egg is going to get fertilized. So using red to emphasize that this egg is now fertilized. So we're nearly done, right? The sporophyte, the original flower, created the mega and microspores. The megaspore grew into the female gametophyte. The female gametophyte made the female gamete, the egg. In the male, they made microspores. These microspores developed into the male gametophyte or pollen. A pollinator brought that pollen to another flower. We have the sperm that have now fertilized this egg. So we now have a fertilized egg. So we have a zygote. This zygote is diploid because this is the culmination of egg meeting sperm. This zygote is essentially a, you know, I'm going to write it, baby sporophyte. I think it's the best way to visualize it, in my opinion. And the seed starts developing. Now, what the seed is, the seed is that ovule. So inside the ovule was the egg. Inside the ovule is the fertilized egg. But the actual ovule itself, that's going to start developing into the seed. So I'm going to use, I'll use red again, just to kind of show this is all one structure. So this ovule is now accumulating all of these fats and these sugars and these proteins. It's going to give it a protective coating around this developing sporophyte. It's creating this seed. So I'll, I'll use an arrow. So this inside one this is going to be the seed. The seed is diploid. All right. But I said that these have protected seeds, right? Our, our conifers, didn't, they, they created a seed and like dropped them, like good luck. But our angiosperms have protected seeds. They're protected by a fruit. So the fruit is this ovary. So the ovary becomes the fruit. This is also diploid. That fruit has a lot of different functions. We're gonna talk about that on the next slide, um, but just know that that ovary is what becomes the fruit. This fruit then drops, it gets dispersed, and is going to 
land or end up somewhere and then that seed can start developing into the adult plant. It can flower and start the cycle all over again. So again, this is not that different from our conifers. It's just now we have flowers and fruits, but pretty much everything is exactly the same. So let's learn a little bit more about fruit. It's not just the kind of fruit that you might eat when you go and pick up stuff from the grocery store. Uh, there's definitely a lot more to it than that. So fruit, the whole point of a fruit is to disperse seeds. Again, the whole point of a fruit is to disperse seeds. It is to get seeds away from the parent plant, to find a new habitat in order to grow. There's a couple different types of fruits that use different dispersal methods. So think about an apple, or I think this is actually a pear. Think about um, a lemon, a tomato, peas. Think about the fruits you buy at the grocery store. The way they're using dispersal is they want their fruits to be eaten by something. They want their fruits to be consumed by an organism, by an animal. Because if you were, maybe don't use animals, maybe use, let's use a dog, right? You, you drop a tomato, your dog just eats the whole thing. It doesn't care about the seeds, it just eats the whole thing. Out in the wild, depending on the fruit, that's, that's pretty much what it is. So it eats the whole thing cool. Then the dog goes and is traveling and is moving and eventually poops and it'll poop out the remains. And those seeds are probably much hardier seeds because that plant is adapted to um, create harder seeds. So they survive the gastrointestinal tract of different organisms that eat it. So that dog poops, it poops out the seeds and essentially a whole bunch of fertilizer with it. And it has now dispersed it. So you have fleshy fruits, the ones that we eat, in hopes that the seeds are going to be dispersed to a new area with fertilizer. Something I want to make a note of, think about your grocery store. Pumpkins, green bell peppers, tomatoes, um, cucumbers. All of those, we call those vegetables, but they're not. They're fruits. Biologically, they're fruits. They have seeds. Because they have seeds, they're literally the fruit of a plant. Culinarily wise, we consider them vegetables because we usually use the fruit for sweeter things and then vegetables for more savory or filling things. One other thing I want to make a point of, so thinking about fruits, let's look at this lemon. This lemon shows five seeds. Remember, an ovule will make a seed. An ovary makes a fruit. So this ovary of the, the lemon plant, this ovary had five ovules in it. It has five seeds. So there was one carpal that had one ovary, but multiple ovules inside of it that all got fertilized to create those multiple seeds. But think about an avocado and the fruit is the ovary. There's one seed, one big seed in it. So that had one ovule. So you can actually tell me something about a plant based on how many seeds that fruit has. Um, so you can think about mango has one seed in it. Okay, so it must have had one ovule in it. Now, those fleshy fruits are not the only way to disperse your seeds. You could have dandelions. The white part of the seed is a dispersal mechanism. This is wind dispersed, and that's a fruit. And it's helping it to move that seed away from the parent plant. These fruits right here, these are called burrs, B-U-R-R. Burrs is showing it on a dog, but if you go hiking, you might get these on your shoes or on your pants. The fruit on these have a, um, a, a spiky outside, and this spiky outside is grasping on to um, uh, fur, grasping onto different structures, and as that dog moves or as that hiker moves, it might fall off elsewhere. So fruits are just dispersal mechanisms, whether it's meant to attract things to eat it, whether it's supposed to hitch a ride on an animal, whether it's wind dispersed, coconuts uh, are water dispersed, a lot of different adaptations to get those seeds out in the world. The last thing that I want to talk about, I'm just going to briefly mention it because we're going to explore this a lot more in class, is this idea of co-evolution. We see co-evolution in a lot of different aspects of life, but for this one, I just want to talk about the co-evolution between pollinators and the angiosperms that they pollinate. 
what coevolution means is that we have the there's a there's an evolutionary relationship between the pollinator the pollinator is evolving and it's driving the evolution of the plant the plant is evolving and driving the evolution of the pollinator so it's essentially two organisms that literally drive the evolution of the other organism. And pollinators, not all of them, but a lot of pollinators have a really cool relationship um, with a pollen producing plant or a plant, and they've kind of driven each other's evolution. We're gonna explore this more in class, but for those of you watching this video as a review, what we're gonna explore is the hummingbird and their relationship with trumpet flowers. Uh, particularly, we're gonna be looking at the long-billed hummingbird. It's actually featured in an episode of Planet Earth 2 in their jungles episode. It starts at 1335. We're gonna watch this in class together because I actually have it. Um, so we're gonna watch this in class together as an example of how co-evolution is you, I don't want to say unique, but is featured uh, with pollinators and the plants they pollinate. But again, it's not all of them. It's just some of them. So with that, that is our last plant. That is our last life cycle. That is the last of all of that. So congratulations. You've made it through all of the life cycles of our plants. Angiosperms pretty much rule the world now. Yes, we have all the other types of plants, but the, the adaptations that seeds have to disperse angiosperm plants is immense and is successful, uh, which is why we see angiosperms everywhere. This is not to say that our different types of plants aren't successful because they still exist, right? They, they still have adaptations that have not been outcompeted against. So while we have tons of angiosperms, don't, don't think that they're more important. Don't think that they're outcompeting others. And in and, and some habitats, maybe they are, but they're not in every single habitat. And the other types of plants definitely have their roles in the ecosystems as well. So there you go, that is it for our plants. Hopefully you guys learn quite a lot and you'll start seeing the world in a slightly different way.